I would say probably that trying to predict whether a company or an idea is going to be successful or not is one equation with 20 variables. You cannot resolve one question with 20 variables. And some of the variables you have no control on whatsoever. Timing. Timing is one of the most important things, you know. There were very successful companies in 2007 going that way. In 2008, the world stopped and bang, they fell. Just timing. They had nothing to do with it. Had they been in a different era or a different period of time, they could have been very successful. Yet, uh, what I'm looking for, and I say I, I want to give an, a good example, and then we can look at it as a case study. In cybersecurity, you know that one of the major, one of the, one of the major problems is that there is a virus, and one of the big companies like uh, Palo Alto, Kaspersky, Checkpoint, start to develop the antivirus. By the time the antivirus is there already, there have been already five mutations of the original virus and they are not sensitive to the new antivirus. So, you know, it's like antibiotics. You keep on fighting the same thing, and all the time there are new, a new bacteria. And then one morning, four guys came, and they said, we have an idea. We shall take the virus, and we shall fast forward, like 15 generations ahead, all the mutations that can happen. Out of those 1,500 mutations that can happen, we shall filter out those that are relevant because some of them are bullshit. Now we are ahead of the game because now we're going to develop an antivirus that will address what the mutations are going to be in 15 generations ahead. When you listen to this, you have this, you know, this shivering, you have this excitement, you say, wow. How do you pick winners? So the first thing is, in today's environment, it's different than it's been historically, and I think that our public policy friends are still catching up with this. Because if you don't understand that innovation is being rethought that quickly, then you're, you get all caught up in whether they have a track record that looks like X, they have this much venture capital money already, they have this or that or whatever. And so, in fact, in the last two and a half years, we've been fundamentally rethinking how we pick the companies that we invest in. And so the first thing we had to open our minds to was what is the intangible asset that they've either patented or are about to patent or think about patenting or are thinking about how they're going to sell and protect for a certain period of time to make money over that period of time? How do they find the customer base? Are they iterating with them already and have them close in with them? What do those things look like? That's where we're going to now. And, and I think, you know, you create, you know, we, Ian said there's some, you know, in agencies that he's created in his history that they were very risk averse. That's why you have agencies like ours. We're quite removed from government. I have a private sector board of directors, which means that we were created to fail, hopefully at least one in four times. And sometimes my board member says that's too, that's too few. It should be one in five or one in six. So we've invested in all kinds of science and technology in companies that didn't work out. What we're trying to do is figure out why that is be faster in our response. So we did two things as well in the last year, feeling, seeing this rapid expansion in innovation pace. First thing we did is we used to, you'll find out if you try to go access certain government funding that they'll have two calls a year and if you don't get in yesterday, the call that was yesterday, it's gonna be a year from now before you can actually access the next round. We threw all that out. Now, if you came to us tomorrow, we tell you right away, yes or no, if you meet our criteria and our target is six months, yes. To, to a board approval. So, you know, even that's not fast enough. We think it should be quicker for the stuff that's fast, like soft or tech, clean tech enabled, data enabled clean tech can be a little bit longer if you're in the larger infrastructure stuff because the customers move more slow, slowly. But what you have to do is find and create institutions that are able to fast fail ideas and work with entrepreneurs as they see it. Everybody asks this question, what's the secret sauce to innovation? And the short answer is, nah, sorry, there isn't one. Uh, there is no secret sauce. I mean, there's, 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 some, there's some rules of the game, there's some principles you can follow. Let me try a few of them. So, first of all, if I look at countries that have done well in innovation, can I really measure that? Well, so if you look across the last 10, 15 years, you can look at the countries and ask, which countries, of developed countries, have grown fastest? Uh, what's been the role of total factor productivity in there? You look, total factor productivity, i.e. innovation, is really, really important for, uh, 
for driving growth. So let's understand what's driven that total factor productivity. Then you start to struggle a bit. Then you really start to struggle. So we can look at Finland. And Finland did some really smart things and was incredibly innovative for about 10 years and isn't now. Israel. Israel did amazing things and went from, you know, almost you know, a, 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 an agro-economy into, into an economy which is incredibly vibrant in a couple of sectors. Will you continue that? I don't know. Across the economy? Eh, not so much. Uh, but th these very, very bright, vibrant sectors have been incredibly, incredibly helpful for Israel. But by the way, what happened in Israel wasn't a, what you've got to do is deliver social cohesion and deliver uh, uh, productivity growth and deliver jobs and change the economy. What it was was some, some proxy intermediate targets around the amount of money that businesses should be spending on research and development. You put more investment in research and development, businesses are going to be more innovative. Uh -huh, it worked. Will it continue to work? Don't know. Which country in the world puts most effort into business uh, R&D? Answer, Korea. Korea was unbelievably innovative. And since the 50s, uh, a really, really nasty, emerging, developing nation to you know, the glory of Samsung, Hyundai, and others right now. But if you ask now, is the Korean economy growing as quickly as it did? Nope. Can Canada follow the sorts of examples of a Finland? Not really. A Korea? No, you're not a developing country. A Singapore? Nah, Canadians are a totalitarian state. You know, hell will freeze over in Scotland will win the World Cup before that happens, right? Canada can experiment. I come back to experimentation. Probably on a province by province basis. And experiment and be brave and change. And the challenge to do that, the challenge to do that is exactly the one that layers articulated. You gotta shift some of the levers of power out beyond what ministers have got a handle on. Because ministers are always thinking about the next election. I worked for them for a hell of a long time. And we gotta move away some of these levers of influence from direct political power because politicians don't like to take risks.